So while the glue is drying on the seat, I want to make these two uh, these two back spindles for the for the seat. I cheated a little bit. Instead of uh, splint splitting a walnut log into staves, uh, I actually had a friend of mine who has a sawmill mill these walnut boards for me from the same tree that the others are made out of. Uh, it just saves you a lot of splitting. And this board you can see has a big knot there and a big knot there. It's clear in this face and on this part of this face. I'm pretty sure I can get one clear blank out of it for this. So we'll put it on the table saw and see what I get out of it. I took a slice around that knot and it cleaned right up. That blank is good enough to use. So like I did on the legs, I'm using a draw knife here to round off the corners, make it a little easier to turn it round with the roughing gouge. Here I am with a roughing gouge turning it round. Once I have the blank turned round I can size it using my calipers here and you begin by marking off and sizing all of the high spots on it so you run up the whole blank with your uh, parting tool and your calipers just going from high spot to high spot all the way down here I am marking a transition sure wish I could work this quick in real time All right, you see I had to widen the uh, the spot where the uh, parting tool went in because the calipers get squeezed a little bit by it. It's good to uh, take your calipers and actually grind them thinner if they need to be. I did that on these. I could probably do a little bit more. The cal calipers, the tips of them should be uh, good and round and should have no sharp edges on it. Otherwise, they'll chatter like crazy while you're while you're turning it. Doesn't hurt to go over the tips of those calipers with steel wool or even a file. Okay, I'm sizing one tenon. There's a tenon on either end of the spindle. Because the wood is green, you want to oversize them by at least 10%, and then we come back and do a final sizing once the, uh, the wood is dried on either end. Okay, now this is the fun part where I just make a smooth transition from high spot to high spot. This is where you can work right along without any interruptions. I'm using the small spindle gouge for this job. I just put a sharp edge on it before I started this part. It's really good to sharpen your tools every time you do a new piece at least touch them up. This piece has some long sections that are really nothing more than a dowel and actually it's kind of a challenge to make your dowel the same thickness all the way from one end to the other. I'm just smoothing things up with the chisel.
with the uh, skew chisel. Scraping it with a flat part. Now I'm locating my beads. I have a couple of beads on this. And you're using the skew chisel to round them off. Now I'm locating this bead here and it's at this part of the process where I'm, I'm making the skinniest part of the whole spindle and as I remove material it gets thinner and thinner and you're going to see the spindle actually deflecting underneath the chisel as I go and work along you'll see it moving and that will cause it to chatter and vibrate which is a bad thing and I'm going to address that in the next segment. So whenever you get to working on a piece that's long and or narrow, you'll get to where it wants to vibrate while you're working with your chisels. And that's bad. It can catch on the chisel. It can break. So to uh, assuage that problem, I made this homemade brace for the middle, just some rollerblade wheels bolted on this jig over here, and that'll hold it steady in the middle while I'm working on either side of it. Uh, this, this spindle's almost done. Just got a little bit left to do, but once I get up to the skinny part up top, it just started vibrating a lot. And I wanted to take care of that once and for all because I got several more of these to do before I'm done. I'll show you it in action. It's pretty firm on either side of it. I really can't move it at all, so it, the rest of the Rest of the chisel work ought to go well.